Uh, we have a sample problem involving chemical equations. It comes from our textbook. Uh, this is problem number 351 from Brown and others, 10th edition. It's a combustion analysis. It's a set of data for a combustion analysis problem. But before we do that, I just want to recap how we do these types of problems. I've dri uh, drawn a little diagram with uh, six circles in it. And these three circles represent one substance, and these three circles represent another substance within any uh, balanced chemical equation. And I just want to show you that with any of these calculations, there are only three basic calculations, each with two permutations, because you can go one way or the other way in the same calculation. So any set of three circles uh, represents one compound, and it can lead you to any set of three other circles, or even within the same set of circles. So if you want to go from here to here, you're dealing with the same chemical. Uh, so if you want to go from grams of a substance to moles of a substance, you would simply divide by its molar mass. And if you want to go from moles of a substance to grams of a substance, you multiply by its molar mass. If you have moles of a substance and you want to find out how many molecules of the substance you have, then you multiply by Avogadro's number. And if you have the, the number of molecules of a substance and you want to find out how many moles you have, you divide by Avogadro's number. If you want to get to the other side of the diagram, then you must go through the stoichiometry of the reaction. So you would use the balanced reaction. You would use the numbers that appear here on a balanced equation to uh, find the ratio between the number of moles of a compound on one side of the equation to the, comp the moles of the compound on the other side of the equation. Or it could even be on the same side. It doesn't have to be on opposite sides of the equation. But the important thing is that you must use a stoichiometric ratio at this point in the calculation. So there are really only three calculations, changing from molecules to moles, grams to moles, or moles to moles. But whenever you do chemistry uh, calculations, you always go to moles. You always have to relate the quantities into moles so that you can uh, derive the, the answer of some other substance, how much of it uh, being produced. So in this, in all the problems we're going to do today we're going to assume the reaction proceeds 100%. So in 351, it asks, menthol, the substance we smell in mentholated cough drops is composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. A 0 0.1005 gram sample of menthol is combusted, producing 0 0.2829 grams of CO2 and 0 0.1159 grams of water. What is the empirical formula for menthol? If the compound has a molar mass of 156 grams per mole, what is its molecular formula? So we began by uh, writing a chemical equation depicting what is happening in the reaction. You have 0 0.1005 grams of menthol, uh, this mystery molecule of, for which we don't know the formula, and that's why I put x, y, and z for the numbers. I don't know what the numbers are. I'm not going to use these variables in any way, but I'm just depicting the fact that I don't know what the numbers are. Uh, we burn the sample in the presence of oxygen using the, the traditional apparatus for doing combustion analysis. And we discover that it produces 0 0.28 grams of CO2 and 0 0.11 grams of, of water. And when we, when we divide by the molar mass of each substance involved, 44 grams of CO2, 18 grams of water, we get the 6.4 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of CO2 and 6.43 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of water. So same, almost the same number of moles of CO2 and water, but you treat the results in slightly different ways. When you know that you have that many moles of CO2, you're also going to know that you have the same number of moles of carbon. And where is all that carbon coming from that appears as CO2? It's coming from here. All the, CO2, all the carbon that was in the molecule appears in the form of CO2. All the hydrogen that was in this molecule appears in the form of H2O. But you treat the two halves of the calculation slightly differently. So there's the same number of moles for carbon as there are CO2, and then you simply multiply by the molar mass of carbon to find out how many grams of carbon was in the original molecule. In the case of water, uh, use a, a mole ratio of 2 to 1, because for every mole of water that's produced, there are two moles of hydrogen that have been um, combusted from the original sample. So we find out from this calculation that we had 1.28 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of hydrogen. We then multiply by the molar mass of hydrogen to find out how many grams of hydrogen we had. And uh, so now we have the amount of 
carbon that was in the molecule, we have the amount of hydrogen that was in the molecule, but we also know that the molecule contained oxygen. So what we're going to do is we add these two numbers and subtract them from the, the mass of the original sample. And that's going to tell us how much of the mass was oxygen. And we accidentally erased some of that. Let's just rewrite the numbers. Okay, so that's how many grams of oxygen are present in the sample. I then take these amounts and I just list them, I listed them here and I redid one part of the calculation because we're traditionally accustomed to starting the calculation from the data that's given to us, but really we've already calculated the mole quantities here. So I, I could have started the calculation right here, I just showed you the steps that would have led up to them if I had only been given, uh, given the data in this form. But we can actually start a calculation here, the only part we don't know is the number of moles of oxygen. So if I take the mass of oxygen, which I just, just discovered here by subtraction from this number, uh, these two numbers, so I, I took these two numbers, added them, and subtracted them from here, find that number, I put the number here, divided by the mass of oxygen, and it gives me how many moles of oxygen. Here are the two quantities of moles I, I calculated earlier. I then divide by the smallest of these three numbers, which is the number of moles of oxygen, and I get the following proportions, 9.96, 19.94 and 1. These results would be slightly disturbing in that they're not very close to the integer values, but we have to recognize that in a real world experiment you always get slight inaccuracies. So this is actually about a 10, this is very close to 20, and of course you get 1 because you divided by the same number. And that gives us the empirical formula of our molecule. The empirical formula is C10H20O. Let's find out what that empirical formula weighted. Let's find out 10 times the mass of carbon, 20 times the mass of hydrogen, and one time, one time the mass of oxygen gives you 156. So because the empirical formula weight is identical to the molar mass, we were told in the problem itself that the molar mass of the substance was 156, then it's the same molecular formula. The empirical formula in this case is identical to the molecular formula. So the molecule is, in fact, C10H20O. In the next problem that I solved for you, it says a piece of aluminum foil, one centimeter square and 0.55 millimeters thick, is allowed to react with bromine to form aluminum bromide, as shown in the accompanying photo. This is again from your textbook, uh, Brown and others, page 115, uh, problem number 365. And part A of the question asks, how many moles of aluminum were used? The density of aluminum is 2.699 grams per centimeter cubed. And B, how many grams of aluminum bromide form, assuming that the aluminum reacts completely? The first step is to find out how much aluminum we have. So we're told that it's a piece of foil, one centimeter in, uh, per side, and with a thickness of 0.55 millimeters. So I decided to convert everything to millimeters. So we know that if it's one centimeter by one centimeter, it's to be 10 by 10 millimeters. To find the volume of that piece of foil, I would say volume is equal length and width by height. So it's 10 times 10 times 0.55 millimeters cubed. That gives you 55 millimeters cubed. I then convert it to centimeters cubed, recalling that 10 millimeters equals one centimeter, one centimeter in linear measure. But we're not using linear measure, we're using volume. So the conversion factor also has to be raised to the power of 3. That's why I put that cube, uh, that power of 3 over here on the, on the bracket. When I distribute that power of 3, the 1 stays the same, centimeters becomes cubed, 10 becomes 1,000, because 10 times 10 times 10 gives you 1,000, and millimeters becomes cubed, which allows you to cancel this millimeters, and the volume of our sample in centimeters cubed is 5.5 times 10 to the minus 2 centimeters cubed, which allows us to enter it in the density equation. Density equals mass over volume. We transpose the B to solve for M, which is the mass of the sample of aluminum, Here's the density of aluminum, here's the, set of the, de the uh, volume of the sample as we just calculated here. And the equal sign is kind of confusing there, because I, the calculation ran over a little bit. And the result is 2.699 times 5.5 gives you 0.148 grams of aluminum. Now we turn to the chemistry. We know how much aluminum is in the reaction. Let's find out what the balanced reaction for the reaction of aluminum with bromine is. Aluminum reacts with bromine to give aluminum bromide. I've balanced the reaction by adding, uh, when I did the balancing, I'll show you how I did it. 
I said to myself, well, there's going to be, we're not going to balance bromine except by increasing the, the number of things present. So let's put a two in front of the aluminum and see what that gives us. If we have two aluminum bromides and two aluminums, that's going to require six bromines, and that's going to be easy to balance by putting a three in front of the bromine. That's how I balance that equation. Now, these numbers signify the stoichiometry of the reaction. It means that two moles of aluminum will react with three, three moles of bromine to give you two moles of aluminum bromide. So the first step in the reaction is to start off by um, finding out how many moles of aluminum we have. We found out the grams over here, so we're going to use that number, 0.148 divided by the molar mass of aluminum. That gives us the moles of aluminum. I wrote that over here. This is the stoichiometry of the reaction. For every two moles of aluminum that are used, two moles of aluminum bromide appear. I put moles of aluminum on the bottom because I want to cancel the moles of uh, aluminum. Your, the denominator of the denominator becomes the numerator. So I want, to, I want to cancel moles of aluminum. And sure enough, I can do that here. The answer is going to be in uh, moles of aluminum bromide. This is the molar mass of aluminum bromide. The 2 over 2 is going to, is going to give us a 1 to 1 ratio. So it's not going to affect, uh, it's going to be an easy calculation. So here we have the moles of aluminum times the molar mass of aluminum bromide because the moles of aluminum is going to be the same as the moles of aluminum bromide. And the result is you get 1.467273439 grams of aluminum bromide. You're only allowed three significant figures, so we would report the answer as 1.47 grams of aluminum bromide. All right, so there we have uh, a multi-step problem. This is typical of what you would get in a stoichiometry question on an exam uh, for, for uh, a grade 12 final examination. And each, each step would require that you have the proper usage of units, proper usage of significant figures, and of course, make sure you check your answer because if you make a mistake somewhere along the calculation, then everything after that point is going to be wrong. Okay.